Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Uh, I know uh, that I alone did not draw this substantial crowd, uh, which is why I will immediately uh, introduce and turn over the briefing to Tom Donilon, the President's National Security Advisor. As you know, the United States is hosting the G8 and NATO summits this year, uh, the G8 at Camp David, NATO in Chicago. And Tom is here to uh, give you a preview uh, of those summits. Uh, as we've done in the past with uh, visitors uh, to the briefing, if uh, you, he'll, he'll make some comments to open. He'll take your questions on related subjects. Uh, and then Tom will uh, depart, and I'll remain to take questions on other matters. Uh, with that, I give you Tom Donnelly. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate the opportunity to come by. I wanted to take a, uh, a few minutes today, and I'll just give a couple of comments at the top, and then take a few. Uh, take a few minutes to give you our perspective on the upcoming summits, the G8 summit at Camp David and the uh, NATO summit in, uh, in Chicago. Uh, and then I'd be glad to take questions, as I said. It's good to see you all this afternoon. Thanks for coming out. Uh, the first uh, thing I wanted to say is that uh, I've been reflecting uh, on uh, where we've come uh, the last uh, three and a half years. And, and the initial summits uh, that the President attended in 2009 um, uh, saw the global economy uh, in free fall. The momentum in Afghanistan had shifted to the Taliban. Al Qaeda was entrenched in a safe haven. Uh, and America's alliances had frayed. Uh, today, I think it's uh, fair to say, and we can discuss this in any detail that you want, uh, that we've made significant progress on each of these issues. The U.S. economy is growing. Al Qaeda's leadership has been devastated. And we've put in place a responsible plan to wind down the war in Afghanistan. And meanwhile, and this has been a top priority of this administration from the outset, our alliance has never been stronger. And I'll talk about that again in a second. Over the next several days, the aim uh, is to build on this progress, and we'll do so at Camp David and in Chicago. And the two summits really do underscore in our embodiment of American leadership on a range of global challenges and advancing several overarching U.S. interests, uh, making the international architecture work effectively in a transformational world. Second, revitalizing, as I said, our core alliances. Uh, and three, really advancing our strategy to end the war in Afghanistan in a responsible fashion. And as a result of our engagement in bilateral, multilateral uh, uh, levels over the course of the administration, uh, we're leading in both these forums. I think we'll see during the course of this weekend real progress made on the goals that I just talked about. So let me talk about what we're going to be doing. Uh, the first uh, meeting will be the G8 meeting beginning Friday evening at Camp David. Uh, I, uh, as a lot of you know, I like to think historically about uh, uh, these things. And I did a little research on Camp David. It's always uh, risky to do this with the presidential historian Mark Noller in the room, but I'll do this anyway, right, at the risk of being, uh, at the risk of being corrected immediately. Uh, first, uh, I want to talk about why the president chose Camp David for this meeting. Uh, first, it, the G8 meeting will be the largest gathering of leaders ever to stay at Camp David. In fact, this is the first time that there will be more than two heads of state at Camp David. Uh, Camp David has hosted over 50 different heads of state in the 70-year history, as, various, as well as various retreats and critical meetings. But again, there have only been two summits uh, held at Camp David. Uh, the Camp David Accords uh, in 1978, where President Carter hosted uh, Prime Minister Begin and Egyptian President Anwar Sadat. Uh, and the Middle East Peace Summit in the 2000s between Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak, Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat, hosted by President uh, Clinton. Uh, the summit is intended to be small and intimate, uh, and the President made a, a conscious decision uh, to host the G8 meeting at Camp David for this reason. Each head of state or government uh, will have his or her own cabin, uh, and they'll have the opportunity, obviously, to meet informally in the margins of the meetings and to take full advantage of the grounds at Camp uh, David. The leader meetings themselves will occur around the dining room table of the Laurel Cabin. Uh, and again, I think this is consistent with the history and purpose of uh, 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 the G8 meetings. It really isn't a back-to-basics approach, if you will. The, uh, as you know, the, the meetings have their origins in the 1970s with the United States hosted informal meetings uh, with financial officials from uh, the major developed economies. In 1975, uh, 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 President uh, Barley just started to stang invited heads of state and government from these countries to uh, Rambouillet, uh, France, for a summit to discuss the oil crisis and economic recovery. Since then, they've become rather large gatherings with infrastructure and uh, 
uh, all kinds of support staff and long communiques. And the president wanted to pull away from that and really get back to basics, really get back to the intent, which is to have the leaders of the developed economies in the world uh, being able to talk about uh, face to face in an intimate session uh, the issues facing, uh, facing us. So that's, the, that's what undergirds the president's decision to have this at Camp David. And I wanted to give you a little flavor of what it would, of what it would, be, like, uh, would it be like up there. Let me then talk about the meeting itself and the objectives for the G8 uh, meeting. Um, obviously, the, uh, and I'll go through, maybe the best way to do this would be just to go through the agenda and how it will unfold uh, during, the course of the, uh, uh, during the course of the meetings. On Friday evening, there'll be a leader's dinner uh, at, uh, at Camp David. Uh, prior to that, by the way, I should mention that President Alon will have his first meeting with President Obama here at the White House uh, Friday morning. I think it's around uh, 11 o'clock Friday morning. Uh, 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 the president looks forward to, uh, uh, to uh, meeting with, with President Alon and his team. Uh, that meeting with the president will be followed by a lunch over at Blair House that Secretary Clinton is hosting for President Alon and his delegation. Uh, again, to begin our, uh, our relationship with, with him uh, and continue our work with an important ally, uh, ally uh, France. Uh, I can talk about that meeting again in some detail if you'd like to do that. Uh, as I said, the schedule begins on Friday evening with a working dinner for the leaders only. Uh, the topic for this dinner will be regional and political issues. I expect that the following issues to, uh, uh, to uh, come up, and again, leaders will raise other issues during the course of, the, uh, course of it. Uh, there'll clearly be a discussion about uh, Iran. Uh, and we expect to be advancing the international consensus around the P5 plus 1 approach uh, to addressing the Iran nuclear issue. And the uh, theme, I think, will be uh, international unity, which has been a hallmark of this project, uh, as well as the uh, uh, previewing our expectations for the May 23rd second round of meetings with the Iranians, meeting between the Iranians and the P5 plus 1 in Baghdad, Iraq. Uh, and that will be a point of discussion on, uh, on Friday evening. Uh, this has been a top priority for this administration. As you all know, we've had a multivariable, intensive approach from the first days that we came into office. This approach has, it, has uh, began with offers for engagement. Those offers for engagement were not met with a response from the Iranians. We proceeded then to, a, again, a multiple uh, variant uh, pressure campaign, frankly, uh, that included a lot, of a lot of elements, including sanctions. Uh, the unprecedented international sanctions campaign that we put in place, I think, has resulted in the Iranians coming to the table. Uh, each member of the G8 is a core member of this sanctions effort. Each member has been absolutely essential to really putting in place what has been an extraordinarily effective, and I think most people would say a surprisingly effective, uh, sanctions effort. Uh, They'll also be pressing uh, the Iranians to take advantage of the diplomatic efforts that we're putting forward. And really, the pressure will be on the Iranians to demonstrate uh, continued good faith coming out of Istanbul, but also the willingness to engage in concrete ways with the P5 plus 1 on addressing the uh, uh, Iranian nuclear program. The message will be that the Iranians uh, should uh, uh, seize this opportunity. Uh, and while this goes on at the th uh, in parallel, the sanctions and pressure effort will continue. Uh, led by the United States and the others who will be at the table on Friday evening. Uh, we also expect that they will, uh, that the leaders will discuss uh, North Korea, uh, discuss uh, uh, Burma, and you saw uh, uh, an announce the announcement today by Secretary Clinton with respect to uh, our easing of investment sanctions uh, in, uh, uh, in Burma. There's been remarkable progress in Burma, and the leaders will want to engage on this, I think, on, on Friday evening. Uh, Burma is at the, at the start of a long uh, but promising path towards democracy. democracy. As you know, the President's made this a top, uh, a top priority. Again, we can talk about this in any, in any detail that you want. And I think you'll also see a discussion on Syria at the meeting on uh, Friday evening. And again, leaders can bring up whatever other issues that they, that they want. But that's the focus. The focus will be the security issues on Friday evening. Uh, the next morning, uh, the focus will turn to the economy. And of course, the global economy, especially the economic situation in the Eurozone, are going to be at the top of the agenda. Uh, this is the first opportunity for the leaders of the major developed economies to meet uh, face to face uh, since uh, President Hollande's election in France and the political events in, uh, in Greece. Uh, this, of course, also will be the first G8 meeting for Prime Minister Monti of Italy and Prime Minister Noda of Japan. 
Um, and obviously this comes at a very delicate time uh, with respect to the Europe, uh, European economy, the Eurozone economy. Let me just say a couple of things about this. Uh, one, uh, the United States uh, welcomes the evolving discussion and debate in Europe about the imperative for jobs and growth. Two, the United States has an extraordinarily significant stake in the outcome of the economic uh, discussions in Europe and the steps that are taken uh, in, uh, in Europe. This is uh, the European Union as a whole, of course, is the largest trading partner of the United States. Uh, and three, uh, the President uh, looks forward uh, to leading a discussion among the leaders about the imperative of having a comprehensive approach uh, to manage the crisis and get on a sustainable path towards recovery in Europe. And this obviously will be a key part of the discussions up at Camp David. The other uh, areas, and I won't go into as much detail on these others, I'll just list them for you and you can uh, obviously ask questions about them. After the discussion during the course of the morning on the, uh, the uh, global economy, focusing again on Europe, there will be separate sequential sessions, if you will, devoted to the following topics. Energy and climate, food security, and as you know, the President will tomorrow deliver a very important uh, speech on a critical initiative that he's had in place here uh, that will make a real difference in the lives of people in Africa. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll have uh, at the, uh, there'll be at, at Camp David a working lunch uh, on food security attended by uh, four African heads of state from Benin, Tanzania, Ghana, and Ethiopia. Uh, so energy and climate, food security, the Afghan economic transition will have, it, will have its own uh, 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 session. This is obviously important as we put together the non-security aspects of the follow-up in Afghanistan post-2014. Post that is, how is Afghanistan going to come out of its war economy into a stable economic situation? And what are the, what are the needs that it's going to have from the international community? This leads up to a donors conference in Tokyo uh, in July. And the last scheduled session uh, at Camp David would be on Middle East and uh, the North Africa transition, following up on the Doville initiative and discussions at the last G8 uh, meeting. That's the, essentially the outlines of the G8 meeting. Uh, NATO, the NATO summit. The President will leave Saturday evening and go to Chicago uh, to host 62 nations and several international organizations uh, for the uh, NATO summit. Uh, this is uh, only the third time since NATO's founding in 1949 that the United States will host a NATO summit. Uh, and it's only the first time uh, it's been hosted in a city other than Washington. The other two times that the United States has hosted uh, NATO summits were in 1978 and 1999, which of course is the 50th anniversary during President Clinton's term. Uh, as I said, 60, 61 countries as well as the EU, uh, the United Nations and the World Bank will be uh, in attendance. There will be a different, diff uh, different groupings, if you will, of countries uh, during the course of the day. Uh, as I said, the President will fly to uh, Chicago on Saturday evening. The first meeting that he'll have on Sunday will be with President Karzai of Afghanistan. Uh, obviously an important meeting because a central focus of the NATO summit will be on Afghanistan and on Af in Afghanistan's future. So the first meeting of the day appropriately is going to be with President Karzai of Afghanistan. Uh, the President will then move into uh, a, a various a, a, a series of NATO meetings. There'll be an initial meeting with the with with just the NATO allies at at, uh, at 28. Uh, that evening on Sunday evening, uh, the NATO allies will meet at Soldier Field for a working dinner, and that'll be just leaders plus one 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 advisor. Uh, on Monday morning, uh, the summit will continue at McCormick Place with discussions on Afghanistan, and this will be a broader meeting. This will be the NATO. Uh, 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 countries, uh, plus the 22 non-NATO Afghan troop or non-NATO troop contributing countries in Afghanistan. Uh, and the second formal meeting on Monday will be a, uh, uh, um, uh, a session uh, with the key partners that we had in various projects around the world with, uh, with, uh, with NATO. I want to talk about NATO and alliances for just a second, then I want to talk about the Afghanistan, then I'll take your questions. The United States and NATO. NATO is a cornerstone alliance for the United States in terms of its ability to advance its international interests. When we came into office uh, almost uh, four years ago, now three and a half years ago, we asked ourselves where we were, uh, where we needed investment, where we needed work that needed to be done, 
And our analysis was that, in fact, alliances needed uh, a tremendous amount of attention by the President, that the alliances were frayed. It had been an exhausting period leading up to 2000, uh, 2009. And the President set about uh, reinvigorating, indeed, one of the first sets of instructions that we got during the transition at the beginning of the administration was to set about really building out and refurbishing, revitalizing our alliances. Why is that? Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk uh, among uh, foreign policy uh, commentators on the issue of decline in U.S. assets and liabilities. Uh, and I don't often see this, but you really should see it. When you put together a list of um, unique American assets, unique American assets going into the future, things that are going to provide for the future of the United States, you talk about its innovative economy, the size of its economy, um, its energy future, its demographic future, which are all unique American assets and really do promise a bright future for the United States. You should also put on that list alliances. No other nation in the world has the set of global alliances that the United States does. No other nation in the world, and this is built on bipartisan work since World War II, has a series of countries that it can go to around the world uh, and work with these countries. And alliances, I will tell you from experience, are a wholly different qualitative set of relationship than coalitions of the willing. Alliances are valued highly by each of the members. You have habits of cooperation. You have shared threat assessments. You have operational capabilities that you practice and work on and can call on in a moment's notice. The Libya operation was a good example of that on NATO. So from the outset of this administration, this has been a strategic priority for the United States, a strategic priority to reinvigorate, undergird our security through revitalizing and reinvigorating our alliances. And this effort at NATO is part of that. Now, I'll just talk about Afghanistan for a minute and I'll take your questions. A focus of the NATO summit will be Afghanistan. And as you all remember, at the NATO summit in Lisbon in 2010, the United States, our allies, and our partners really set forth the core strategy and the way forward in Afghanistan. And that is that we would begin transitioning in 2011, uh, that the lead for uh, the Afghanistan having full responsibility uh, for security across the country would end at the end of 2014, would, would be at the end of 2014, and that the ISAF military mission would end at that point. Uh, and that's the, and it was under the rubric of in together, out together. And again, I think that the Lisbon uh, a summit was a, was a really an essential moment in our effort here. Afghanistan, of course, had been quite a um, hot issue between the United States and Europe and, and partners around the world. There had been a lot of disputes. There had been questions about whether or not the group of countries in Afghanistan could see this project through. And I think with the President's leadership and the w hard work of our allies and partners, we put in place a multi-year effort to responsibly address the goals that we had, defeating al-Qaeda, and ensuring that Afghanistan would not be in the future a safe haven for al-Qaeda or associated groups that would strike the United States. Uh, and to do so together, to have the time to do it responsibly, and we're on, path, we're on a path to do that. What this, Nate, what this summit is about is the, is the next step on that trend, the next steps, if you will, on that transition project, uh, that transition until the end of 2014 and then beyond. And there are really three elements that I'll mention, and then we, I'll take your questions. Uh, the first is, with respect to the next steps in transition, the, the next steps towards 2014, is that the Alliance will decide that in 2013 that the mission will shift for its forces. That is, that the mission will shift from the ISAF forces, the United States forces as part of ISAF, being in the combat lead to stepping back and getting into principally a train and advise mode, with the Afghans going into the combat lead all over the country. Uh, and that's essential as you th if you think about how you get to the end of 2014 with full Afghan responsibility for their security. You need to start that process. You need to get the Afghans out front with the United States and its allies and partners supporting them moving forward. That's the first uh, uh, element of what will be talked about and decided at, uh, at Chicago. The second will be a discussion of and an agreement on uh, the structure and sustainability of the Afghan National Forces at, as you go past 2014. That is, what should their size be, what should the mission be, and how will it be paid for? Sustainment, of course, is a uh, euphemism for how will it be paid for going after 2014. And we've made very good progress on this. As you know, I think currently we're at about uh, 330,000 Afghan forces. That will surge up to 352,000 Afghan forces. We will then, at some point after 2014, start to go down to a sustainable level, and we're working through the modeling on that. Uh, 
of Afghan forces that will be the level that will be required as assessed by our military in conjunction with the Afghans going forward. Sustainment. The cost of this will be around, in our judgment, around $4 billion a year. And what the United States has been doing, again, working with our ISAF partners, has been, and we've worked with about 30 countries now uh, to work through commitments, and this is two and a half years from now, work through, work through multi-year commitments to pay for that force. And we've made enormous progress on this. This is not a pledging conference. This is not the end of that project. But I can tell you at this point uh, that, uh, again, we've had over 30 countries make commitments. Some of them will be an have announced them. And you've seen leadership announcements coming from the United Kingdom with $110 million a year, Australia to $100 million a year, Germany to $195 million a year. Uh, these are leading countries. There are, there are many others. Uh, some of them will make announcements during the course of the summit again, but this won't be the end of the work. But we have made really substantial progress towards burden sharing, towards uh, continuing support for Afghan security, but with the United States not having to bear the whole load. The third thing that will be discussed at, uh, uh, at Chicago will be the nature of the presence in Afghanistan after 2014. After the ISAF combat mission ends, what, it, what are the plans for NATO? And there'll be a discussion about essentially focusing on a much smaller sized uh, NATO training and assisting and advising mission uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan. So uh, Chicago is a critical milestone and the next step uh, towards our, a responsible uh, ending of this war, towards our achieving, very importantly, our goals uh, in this effort in Afghanistan, and really kind of the execution of the strategy that the President laid out in his speech of Bagram. So with that, Jay. Um, we, uh, I'm glad to go on for another three or four hours, or I can take your questions. <laughs> Why don't we start with, uh, with Ben and uh, yeah. uh, have Tom answer yeah. a few questions and then let him get back, uh, okay. back to work. Good afternoon, Ben. Thanks, Tom. Um, NATO question, GA question. Okay. On NATO, is uh, President Obama uh, plan to meet with President Zardari, either individually or, or with Karzai, and then you can tell us about the, um, the state of that uh, supply route? Sure. Uh, the question was on President Zadari's attendance at the NATO summit. Uh, as you know, President Zadari was invited uh, by NATO to achieve, uh, to, to attend the summit. President uh, Zadari was invited to attend the summit. He'll do so. He's coming with his foreign minister and his foreign secretary, uh, and he'll participate in the meetings on, uh, uh, on Sunday, the first point. The second is we have made real progress, I think, towards resolving the issue around opening up the ground supply lines, uh, which have been closed since the November across border uh, incident uh, where 24 Pakistani soldiers were killed. Uh, the uh, key government groups uh, in uh, Islamabad uh, have instructed their negotiators uh, to move to conclude these negotiations. Uh, we have our negotiations, uh, ne negotiators out there as well, and we're making progress towards that. Whether that will be done in the next few days or not, I can't, I can't judge at this point, but there's been a decision on both sides to reach a conclusion of this. Uh, uh, of this going, uh, going forward, and that's important, obviously, for us. At this point, as I said, there are 61 countries uh, going to be present there, and the President is not going to have bilaterals with all of them. There's not a plan at this point to have a separate bilateral meeting with President Zadari, but he will see him, obviously. The President will see him during the course of the sessions that we have uh, in, uh, in Chicago. Okay. Um, the GA question you mentioned in Syria will be one of the topics yeah. on Friday night. Can you just give us a sense of, given the, the players that are going to be involved, uh, what expectations you have, if any, for any steps on what happens if the Anon plan uh, doesn't work? And will there be any uh, expectations for progress? Yeah. I think this, uh, that uh, I think all the countries present uh, at the uh, G8 summit um, have real concerns and need to have real concerns about the violence level in Syria. Uh, I think that the death toll right now is approaching maybe 8,000. Uh, and the Assad regime has, uh, you know, undertaken a brutal response to the uh, uh, against its own people, who are trying to express their views. Uh, I think that, that there's a, and there'll be um, a, a general uh, disapproval of that. Obviously, uh, number one. Number two uh, is that each of the uh, members who will be present at the G8 meeting. Uh, all uh, support the Anon, the, the Anon plan. Kofi Annan, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, who's the lead UN person uh, at try, at trying to advance a, a ceasefire and a political transition uh, effort in, uh, in Syria. Uh, number three, uh, I think that there'll be a focus at the G8 discussion on the need, yes, to bring down the violence, yes, to see the monitors who are, there's about 240, I think, in Syria at this point, 
uh, see the monitors have access and to try to bring down the violence through their, uh, through their efforts, but also to begin a political discussion about a transition in, in Syria. Um, I think that'll be the basic outlines of the discussion. Yeah. Uh, Helene and then Jeff. Hi, Helene. Hi. Um, two questions. Yes. One, you mentioned that NATO will be very much about turning the country, Afghanistan, over to uh, Afghan leaders. Yes. Can you, given that, can you give me a broad definition of what sort of Afghanistan you hope to leave behind in 2014? Yeah. And then separately on Iran, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy was long, has long been considered to be one of the toughest voices for the Western sanctions policy on Iran. Are you concerned at all that with the change in government in France that you may lose sort of the strong support you've been having from France on the Iran sanctions regime? Uh, okay, I'd be glad to take those questions. Uh, but I need to write down the second one. I'll forget what it is. The, uh, I can repeat it. Yeah. <laughs> With respect to Afghanistan, uh, Helene, the goal uh, is to have an Afghanistan again that has uh, a degree of stability such that, uh, that forces like al-Qaeda and associated groups cannot have safe haven unimpeded, uh, which could threaten the region and threaten U.S. and other interests in the world, uh, number one. Number two. Uh, an Afghanistan that has a, a set of security assets uh, that allow it to provide for that modicum of stability and to be able to protect itself against groups uh, like that. Uh, and an, uh, an Afghan national force of sufficient size and sustainability that these goals can be achieved. Uh, and that will be a real focus of the discussion in, uh, in Chicago. But as I said, it's also important uh, for the United States, its partners and its allies around the world to also focus on the non-security aspects of this. That is, when you have a drop in security expenditures, which will happen right, when ISAF finishes its mission at the end of 2014, the goal is to have a sustainable economy uh, going forward. And that's an important focus for us in the next two and a half years. Uh, a couple of things on this. We have a comprehensive approach, and we are working on this now, as evidenced by this discussion, years in advance. Uh, to try to put in place the building blocks that can achieve the goals that I, uh, that I laid out. Uh, by the way, we also want to have you know, a, uh, uh, a solid political transition in Afghanistan. Uh, there will be elections uh, for president in uh, the middle of 20 and 2014. Uh, and it's important, obviously, that the uh, Afghans put in place a sustainable political process as well uh, going, uh, going forward. Uh, we also, region-wide, right, uh, also want to get to a place uh, where we achieve our core goal. And our core goal is the strategic defeat of al-Qaeda. Uh, the defeat of al-Qaeda is such that uh, it no longer presents a, uh, uh, a threat to the United States, uh, our allies, or our other interests. Uh, and as you know, this has been a central part of the foreign policy of the United States, uh, especially, I think, uh, in terms of its focus since we come into office. And again, this is a daily effort that we pursue relentlessly uh, against uh, al-Qaeda. Uh, with respect to Iran. Uh, we fully expect uh, France to, uh, to uh, be a, a, a good ally going forward. Uh, again, the government in France has only been in place for a day or so, uh, so we haven't had the kind of detailed discussions uh, uh, that we will have uh, with them beginning uh, tomorrow, although we did have some of our team go over at the end of last week and begin discussions. I expect that we'll have good support from France on the uh, Iran issue. I expect that we'll have good support from France on the P5 plus one uh, issues going, uh, going forward. Uh, as well as on a range of other issues. Now, you know, we'll have to work through uh, uh, other issues. Uh, the stances that the, the President Hollande took during the course of his campaign, obviously, he's, he intends to, to keep uh, as President. Uh, but I, uh, at this point, frankly, uh, uh, see, a, uh, see a good relationship building between us already. Jeff. Uh, Tom, two Hi. questions. Hi. Two questions on the G8. Yeah. Um, first of all, do you expect the President to bring up the issue of oil reserves? and releasing oil reserves, and will that be reflected in the G8 communique? And my second question is about the EU leaders. Um, does the United States have an interest in exploiting the difference between Mr. Hollande and Mrs. Merkel on the austerity versus mm -hmm. growth debate? Uh, the first question, with respect, to, uh, with respect to oil, as I said, one of the designated sessions during the course of the G8 will be on energy and climate. And there'll be a broad discussion uh, there, again, with the President discussing his all-of-the-above strategy for, 
uh, for energy, de energy development. And there'll be discussions on improving energy efficiency, energy security, while also addressing climate change, as you would, as you would imagine. With respect to the oil situation, uh, the leaders will certainly, I don't have any announcement for you uh, on that, uh, the leaders will certainly discuss that uh, situation. Uh, the leaders uh, and we have been engaged in an ongoing way uh, in monitoring the global oil situation, particularly in light of the, partic of the effective sanctions that we've had on Iran and its effect on oil markets. Uh, we'll continue that monitoring. I'm sure that the, uh, the uh, uh, leaders will discuss the range of options that they might have before them. Uh, so at this point, what I can tell you is I, I, don't, I don't have any announcements uh, here, uh, but it will be, I'm certain, a topic of discussion. Uh, no, well, the oil markets generally. I don't want to say anything specific about what, what options might be discussed and not discussed. I think it is fair to say that during the course of the energy and climate discussion that there will be a discussion about oil markets, including continuing to monitoring the state of those markets, right, particularly in light of the Iranian sanctions uh, uh, effort. Uh, now, with respect to your question about uh, exploiting differences, uh, that's not, that's not uh, the intention of, of the President or the United States here. Uh, I think, and you saw that the uh, uh, President Alon and, and uh, Chancellor Merkel had their initial meeting uh, a day ago. Uh, this will be a discussion, as I said, about uh, addressing the issue of, in a comprehensive way, of the current crisis and the ongoing need for growth and jobs. And uh, I think that that is in all the interest of each of the European leaders, in the, in the interest of all the global leaders. Uh, I th there'll be a discussion, I believe, about specific steps that might be taken. Uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to move forward, but I don't think that uh, the nature of these conversations are going to be anything like uh, taking one side or the other trying to exploit. The nature of these conversations will be about a coherent and common goal of having the crisis in Europe, uh, current crisis managed well, and getting on a path towards a sustainable recovery. There are some very clear differences between the leaders who will be sitting at that table. Well, we'll, have, well let's, let's, let's let the leaders speak for themselves at the, the, uh, at the table. Uh, uh, but I do think, I do think I say, Jeff, it is important that the president uh, uh, will lead, you know, will lead a discussion uh, here. And, and as the host, I think his, his, uh, the participants expect him to uh, lead a discussion about how best to address these, uh, address these issues. Now, this is not the first discussion that President Obama has had with European leaders about economic issues, and they have been constructive, and I expect these will as well. Margaret. Um, I'll try not to be too repetitive. Hi, um, I'm great. Thank you. I want to revisit both of Jeff's questions though slightly. Um, okay. On the SPR, um, without previewing anything specific, yes. can you tell us whether the U.S. has <laughs> benchmarks for any coordinated release of strategic petroleum stocks? Will you sort of start with something there? <coughs> Second yeah, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's useful for me to comment any further on the on a potential SPR release because I don't have anything to I don't have any announcement to make on that. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, on the question of Olan versus Merkel, yeah. I'm wondering, do you see him at this point as more in line with the president's instincts on how Europe should approach this? Um, do you see that he could be your new go-to person or serve kind of an even role with Merkel as your go-to person in Europe? Or I mean, I'm not trying to make the divisive question. Let me, say, let me say two things in response. Uh, and the first really, uh, I think, is important to say. Uh, the United States has had a very good relationship with President Sarkozy. Uh, and, and indeed, President Sarkozy was a very strong supporter of the U.S.-France uh, uh, relationship. Uh, and it was an incredibly productive and constructive uh, relationship, number one. Number two, we will work to build the same kind of relationship with President Hollande. Uh, the first meeting between President Hollande and President Obama will be tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. So it would be premature for me to kind of speculate on the positions that he'll, be, that he'll be putting forward. But based on what we understand the discussions were between President Hollande and Chancellor Merkel, and based on what I can tell you about the President's approach uh, to these uh, issues, I think you can look forward to an open discussion uh, and a discussion where uh, it's important uh, for them to agree on the common goal, which has to be. It has to be to preserve the foundations of the Eurozone, uh, to uh, address the current uh, crisis facing uh, Europe, particularly uh, as a result of uh, the political events in Greece. And in third, and you now see this discussed, I think, more broadly in Europe, which is why I said at the outset that we welcomed the evolution of the discussion in Europe uh, towards growth and jobs. Uh, but th you see that now being discussed much more broadly in Europe, and I think that will be on the table for discussion during the course of the weekend.
Okay. First Hi, all, Jake. Thanks for How are you? doing this. I appreciate it. Um, uh, two questions. One, uh, given, according to Mr. Brennan, President Obama's desire for there to be more transparency when it comes to the drone program, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could uh, tell us what your concerns are given the lawsuits in Pakistan uh, about the drone program, specifically the members of the tribal jirga that were killed in, in 2011, if you're afraid that that is going to uh, have an effect um, not only on the drone program but on, on diplomatic relations with Pakistan. And my second question, uh, having to do with, uh, and I'll, if you need a reminder of the second question, I'll, I'll be here too. Just Go ahead. Um, the second question, dealing with the, the, with the handover to Afghan security forces, yeah. How concerned is the administration at this point when it comes um, to the green on blue incidents, uh, which seem to be keep, which seem to keep happen, happening? Uh, are you still convinced? Is the administration still convinced, as it was weeks ago, that there's no real correlation between this, I these incidents uh, and the fact that they keep happening? I don't know the percentage right now, but I think it might be roughly a third of U.S. casualties this year are, are from green on blue incidents. Uh, <coughs> How, what does that say about the, the condition of the Afghan forces when we hand over the country? Uh, on the first question, I really can't. I really can't comment on either any, on either a lawsuit or, or specific uh, or specific efforts. I can speak generally, though, okay. uh, about it. Uh, we have undertaken, as I said uh, earlier, uh, from the outset of this administration, a determined effort uh, to uh, and a targeted effort, which was really critical against al-Qaeda and associated forces who intend to do harm to the United States. Uh, and uh, that effort has been successful. Uh, and that effort has a lot of elements to it. Uh, that effort is carefully overseen uh, by, uh, by the White House, by the President, uh, and by the senior members of the administration, and carried out consistent with, as John's speech uh, laid out uh, at the Wilson Center, uh, really consistent with uh, international law, domestic law, ethics, rules of war. Uh, and those are the instructions we have from the president, and that's what we do every day uh, with respect to these uh, with respect to these programs. So I really can't go any further than that, uh, 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 Jake. Um, with respect to uh, transition in this in the so-called uh, green on blue uh, issues, I guess I say the following things about that. Uh, number one is we have built with the Afghans and our partners a very large Afghan uh, uh, national army. Uh, Afghan National Force. Uh, it's now, as I said, I think, and we can, uh, Caitlin and others can check the numbers, I think it's, around, it's over 330,000 forces at this point, heading to 352,000. That's the first point. The second is so uh, that the number of instances, right, that you raise are quite small uh, when you take against the backdrop of building a very large force uh, for the uh, ultimate security uh, of Afghanistan. Third, the performance of the Afghan National Forces in some quite important instances, as you know, including the attacks in Kabul recently and elsewhere, have been very good. Uh, and I think re uh, reflects, with respect to the training of those specific forces, and I think more generally, progress that's been made. Uh, number four, uh, with respect to uh, the quality of the force uh, going forward, uh, as I said, we are, you know, we're two and a half years out right, from uh, an, uh, an ultimate turnover to full Afghan lead, although we will decide in Chicago, I believe, the leaders will decide in Chicago, that that transition should begin in the course of 2013. That transition, meaning the transition from the United States and ISAF forces being in the lead to having the, the, us step back and advise and assist role and the Afghans being in the lead. Number five, um, uh, there are stresses and strains in a war zone. Uh, and uh, there are lots of reasons for these instances. Uh, and um, uh, we have to address them seriously, uh, come up with systems uh, for addressing what can be uh, uh, really kind of very complex situations, and we're doing that. General John Allen is very focused on this. Uh, and again, putting in place the kinds of systems, the kind of screening uh, that you want to have in place uh, to, ins to ensure that you minimize these kinds of instances. But the overall point I would make is that when taken against the backdrop of the scale of the force that's being built by the United States and ISAF, this is not a large number of instances. That said, it has to be taken very seriously because, as, as you're saying, Jake, you have to ask yourself, right, why? You have to ask yourself, if this, if this is a trend, why is that trend 
uh, 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 ongoing. You have to ask yourself, then, what can we do about that, right, in order to ensure that we do our very best to protect our forces, our men and women who are serving in Afghanistan, and our allies and partners. Could you uh, yeah. can I just do a quick follow on Browns, just because you didn't really answer the question, so I'll offer a substitute question, which is, given the transparency yes. that this, the President Obama has called for, yeah. right, can, can we, do we pay innocent civilians uh, when they're killed by, I know that we do so, for instance, if there's an, a, an accident if there's in Afghanistan. If there's a civilian casualty inc uh, uh, incident in uh, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, you know, we obviously will investigate it and uh, uh, put forward compensation, obviously, for the uh, for the loss of loved ones. But what if, if it's not in Afghanistan? What if it's in a different yeah. country in which we're operating different techniques yeah. of military operation, yeah. and innocent civilians are killed? Does the United States do anything to compensate yeah. the families? Well, I mean, there's a, there's a, there are a lot of uh, uh, possibilities in that question, including instances like occurred in the cross-border incident at the end of November in Pakistan, uh, where it would be, I think, appropriate to talk about compensation uh, issues. I don't know if compensation was ultimately paid in that case. That was those were Pakistani soldiers uh, who were uh, killed. Uh, with respect to uh, other uh, examples, Jake, I'm just not going to go there. Um, let's do two more. Uh, Jessica and Steve. Okay. Uh, Hi, Jessica. Hi. Hi. So in response to a question Helene asked, you said that you were confident that uh, President Hollande will keep his campaign commitments. Uh, does this mean that you, or how confident are you that the President will be able to persuade him to uh, give up his campaign pledge to withdraw troops from Afghanistan by year's no. end? I'll, I'll tell you a couple things about that, and I, and I, I said that uh, 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 directly. Uh, Helene's question was about Iran, right? And uh, and I think that we look forward to having France as a, as a strong ally in Iran. But we look forward to having France as a strong ally generally. Now, to go to your question with respect to Afghanistan, uh, what President Hollande said during the course of his campaign was that he would withdraw all combat troops from uh, Afghanistan by the end of 2012. He'll have to make his national decision with respect to that. Uh, what we would look to a country to do uh, as they make national decisions, and indeed we made national decisions with respect to our withdrawal pace as well. You know, we decided that we would, we would draw down our surge troops, uh, the full 33,000 of the surge by the end of September of this year, and that's what we're doing. But we would look to an ally to make those decisions in the context of the overall Lisbon uh, uh, framework. And that framework allows for different kinds of contributions to be made uh, by, uh, by countries. Um, Contributions can include combat troops, right? Uh, I would point out that the province where the French are most prominent right now is a province that's scheduled to transition during the course of this year, Capisa. Uh, but we would look to allies to make their national decisions in the context of the overall alliance approach, which has us in as ISAF until the end of 2014. You can make all kinds of contributions. You can make combat troop contributions. You can make train and assist kinds of contributions. You can make other kinds of contributions, right? And we'll have a discussion with the French about where they want to go on this. But the, but the key concept here, though, is, again, uh, despite the specific nature of the contribution and despite the national decision you might make about pace of withdrawal or timing of withdrawal, that you are a member of the alliance and all in, you know, kind of in together and out together as an alliance and, and a, in a general fashion. Okay, so we should look for something along the lines of what the U.S. has already done, where the U.S. is, maybe they might withdraw but their combat troops, but leave in training missions. Can't speak for him, uh, Jessica, you yeah. know, but I, but, I, but, I, but I said that I think those would be the kinds of discussions that we look forward to having. I'm being very direct with you, oh. right? Uh, the, the, the kinds of discussions that we would look forward to having is what exactly will be the French contribution going forward, taking into account that President Hollande ran for president of France, he ran on a platform. I'm sure that he'll, he intends to, co to keep his campaign commitments. Uh, but also, France is a member of the alliance. It's a member of ISAF. It's an ally of the United States. And so I think it's fully, fully you know, appropriate for us to have a discussion about this. Another yeah. Afghanistan-related question. Are the U.S. pledges to Afghanistan unconditional regardless of who wins the presidential election in 2014? Well, that, I, I don't... Uh, well, uh, that the the, the uh, strategic partnership agreement, yeah, that President Obama and President Karzai signed. Uh, a couple of things about that. First of all, that is that is an agreement between the United States and Afghanistan, not an agreement between individuals. All right, it's an agree it's a national agreement that was entered into because it was in the interest of the United States to enter Afghanistan. That's the first thing. The second thing is that it has obligations on both sides, uh, which we would which we. Uh, uh, would uh, uh, seek to being implemented. Uh, there's obligations on the U.S. side, there's obligations on the Afghan side. 
Okay, uh, Stephen, and we'll let Tom go. Okay. Um, on NATO, how concerned is the U.S. that the continuing wave of budget cuts and austerity in Europe could yeah. hamper NATO's capacity to act in future on an operation like Libya? And as the conversation moves towards talk about growth in Europe, do you expect any uh, actions that could impact the economy, the, the European economy in the short term, and obviously the, with this knock-on effect on the U.S. economy? Actions in what? Good context. Actual Any actions on growth, rather than simply talking about how growth is nice. is, is an important factor. Okay. Uh, with respect to uh, NATO and uh, way forward, uh, they'll one of the sessions, indeed the first alliance session, uh, will be devoted to NATO capabilities, uh, and uh, they have uh, the NATO uh, allies have undertaken a study over the last two years, uh, focused on those capabilities that it believes are essential into the future. Uh, and parts of that, of course, are missile defense. And we're, by the way, we'll hit a milestone at this, uh, at this meeting where uh, we'll declare that the uh, NATO missile defense system is, uh, has achieved a level of interim capability. And that means that the United States at this point still com feels comfortable making real contributions of assets, including the radars in Turkey. Uh, 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 surveillance. Uh, where NATO has agreed to uh, put together an alliance ground uh, surveillance system. Uh, but those are, that's, that's the first point. The first point is you need to decide what capabilities you need. And I think NATO has done that, and that will be approved uh, at, uh, at Chicago. Uh, this allows, by the way, for efficiencies. Uh, it allows for false multipliers, right? That was the case in, uh, uh, in Libya. Uh, I do think, though, it's a fair point. Uh, to uh, consider, though, that even if you do get efficiencies, even if you do have uh, force multipliers through alliance work, uh, even if you do have uh, a focus on those things you need to do and, and some of the things you don't, you don't you're not going to continue to do, it does take a level of funding right, going forward. And uh, you know, uh, Secretary Gates gave a speech, his valedictory speech uh, to NATO, focused on this. And I think he made fair points. And that is a discussion we have on an ongoing basis with respect to uh, with respect to NATO, I think it's a fair point uh, going forward, and one that needs to be needs a consistent uh, consistent focus. Uh, with respect to um, actions that could be taken, uh, I don't want to comment on. I, I, I think this is this is a uh, uh, this will be a discussion among the leaders. The leaders, like I said, I think will focus on on specifics and specific concepts and ideas uh, for growth and jobs. But I would also point out that the ultimate decisions on that will be decisions taken in the Eurozone. And in fact, there's a, uh, a European summit meeting following almost uh, immediately after uh, the uh, G8 summit and the uh, NATO summit uh, on May 23rd in Europe. Anything else? I want to thank Tom. I, I think it is appropriate, though, since you, since you mentioned Professor Noller at the start, yes. that yeah. perhaps uh, yeah. uh, he get the last question. Well, now, now it, 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 first of all, <laughs> taking the last question, one more question, of course, Someone, who, right. someone who started here, <laughs> someone, someone who started here 35 years ago should really know that, not to take one last question. And secondly, and setting up Camp David to accommodate ed, eight heads of state. Yeah. Not all the cabins are equal there. How do you decide who gets what cabins? What are you doing with all of the yeah. aides and assistants and security details? Mm -hmm. There's not room for them up there. Well, the, How well, have you put well, this together? Well, there are, well, there, I, well there, there are a couple of points on that. Uh, and the, 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 the allocation system, of course, is classified. Right? <laughs> and really can't, uh, can't uh, go into that. But there, is, I, I, they'll have, there are a couple of things to say. Uh, one is is that it's a it's a complex of buildings, Mark, as you know, and there are, and there is there is adequate and we during the planning when we made before we made the decision, uh, a team led by Alyssa Mastromonaco here and uh, George Mulligan in the in the uh, White House military office uh, went through this in great detail, and there are adequate facilities uh, there uh, for each delegation, each head of state to have his or her cabin, as I said, uh, and for uh, each to be accompanied by. Uh, a key staff person, in some case two or three staff people. Uh, additionally, of course, there are uh, setups there for communications and uh, some of my team and others up there. Um, but it's adequate. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty extensive facility. And maybe we could get Ben uh, a, a deeper briefing on that, seriously, on the, uh, on the stuff. I'm as interested in it as you are. Is it kind of rustic for heads of state? Is it, is it rustic for heads yeah, of state? Yeah, is it kind of rustic up there for heads of state? Uh, 
you know, I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island, right? You know, I never had a lawn bigger than three feet in front of my house. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm not really the one to comment on rustic car. <laughs> Thank you, Tom, very much. Thank you all. Good to see you guys. Thank you. What has briefing been? I'll yeah. the press surroundings yeah, we'll have uh, more details as they become available. I, I, you all may have uh, had your fill of briefing. Uh, that would be fine with me, but if you have, uh, Bill has for sure. If you have uh, any other questions, uh, I can take them uh, for a few minutes. Yes, Ed. Ron, I just, uh, since Mr. Donnellan was repeating the general policy of the administration, which is uh, to have international unity, what's your reaction? I didn't hear him react to Senate Republicans blocking Senator Reid from moving forward on new sanctions against Iran, since I assume you wanted those, you wanted that action to take place before Camp David so you could show some unity. Well, I think, Ed, we have uh, worked with Congress as we built the uh, most significant sanctions regime against Iran, and we will continue to consult with Congress uh, on Iran sanctions, and, and uh, we will welcome additional tools uh, if Congress makes them available uh, to pressure the regime. Uh, you know, I think broadly speaking, uh, it can be said that we share Congress's view uh, on a range of Iran-related matters, uh, and that was reflected in the President's announcement of an uh, executive order targeting entities that use technology to help the Iranian and Syrian regimes commit grave human rights abuses. So I don't have a specific reaction to uh, uh, today's action on the Hill, but uh, we have viewed this uh, in a way that uh, I think demonstrates that we share concern about Iran uh, uh, with Congress, and we have worked with Congress to um, together build the kind of uh, sanctions regime that has as you know, uh, put unprecedented pressure on the regime, isolated that regime uh, to a degree that uh, it has never been isolated before, and we believe uh, successfully uh, uh, led to a point where now we um, are in P5 plus one uh, negotiations that uh, hopefully will move forward. Quick one on the Euro debt crisis. Um, obviously, Tom was asked about um, possible tensions between Germany and France. The British Prime Minister put out a three-point plan today. There's elements of that that uh, Angela Merkel does not support. Uh, my question is, given those divisions, how does the President approach this? What What is his goal to try to bring the parties together? Does he, I mean, there's all these different plans floating around. We've heard for months they're getting, they're going to turn the corner. Uh, what do you hope to get out of this, especially since the U.S. has its own debt problems? Mm -hmm. And how could that complicate the president's hand when he's got this fight going on with Boehner? Well, I'd say a couple of things. First of all, um, I'd point you to some of the comments that Tom Donilon just made here, uh, the National Security Advisor. Uh, he spoke clearly about the fact that we um, do have a stake in Europe's economic future, and that fact is reflected in the um, manner with which we've engaged with our European counterparts, both at the uh, level of the President and at the level of uh, Secretary Geithner and others in the Cabinet. And we continue to do that. And the meeting uh, at the G8 will be uh, present an opportunity, present an opportunity for President Obama to meet with uh, uh, Eurozone heads of state who are members of the G8 to, uh, to further those discussions. And, I, you know, as Tom said, we, uh, you know, w w the President has long made clear, and he certainly made clear in, uh, at the G20 in Cannes, that uh, he believes that uh, an approach that uh, takes into account uh, the need for uh, further growth and job creation, uh, a balanced approach that um, includes not just austerity but growth and job creation, is the right is the right approach, and it's and it's something that uh, we can, uh, when we discuss this with our European allies. Uh, we can point to some of our own experiences. I think that, uh, as you know, the last several years of positive GDP growth here in the United States, the last 26 months of uh, positive private sector job creation point to um, the efficacy of taking measures that help stimulate growth and, and create jobs. Uh, and the President's commitment 
uh, as demonstrated by the laws you signed that have already resulted in uh, locking in two trillion dollars of uh, spending cuts uh, and his commitment to do more through his budget proposal demonstrates that you need to have that balanced approach that, that uh, uh, facilitating growth and job creation in the near term uh, can uh, be joined with efforts to deal with uh, medium and long term uh, fiscal issues uh, in a way that I think serves uh, the overall interest very well. And that's uh, the, pro the approach the President has taken. That's the, uh, the uh, I think, the, the view that he'll take into his meetings this weekend. Uh, uh, Kristen? Jay, uh, President Putin doesn't plan to attend the G8 or NATO summits this weekend. Does President Obama see this as a step backwards in the so-called reset with Russia? No, we addressed this uh, at the time when, when uh, uh, President Putin made clear that because he was in the process of uh, uh, building out his uh, government, that uh, he was not going to be able to attend. He'll send Prime Minister Medvedev, uh, as I understand it. And, and the President Obama will meet with President Putin very soon in, at the G20 in, in Mexico. So uh, they've had conversations by phone. And uh, you know our ap ap approach to our relationship with Russia is today as it, as it has been, which is um, we have engaged with Russia. We have uh, worked with the Russian government uh, on shared interests and goals in a cooperative fashion that have been uh, that have produced, I think, beneficial results for both countries. Uh, and we've been clear about uh, issues that we disagree on. But the overall uh, mindset has been, I think, uh, both uh, here in Washington and in Moscow, that uh, that we should not let uh, the fact that we disagree on some issues prevent us from making progress on others, because we can continue to work on those areas of disagreement, for example, uh, with regards to European missile defense, um, uh, and try to resolve our disagreements, and even as we do, continue to make progress in other areas. So the President looks forward to meeting with President Putin uh, in about a month. Jake. And then uh, Andre, Jake and then Andre. Uh, Jay, you joined the uh, Obama team long after uh, President Obama had, had uh, cut off his ties with Reverend Wright, but his name has reemerged in the news uh, lately. First of all, there's this, uh, there was this proposal for a super PAC that the New York Times broke uh, to run an ad campaign that generally that talked a lot about uh, the influence of Reverend Wright on President Obama. And then also Reverend Wright himself uh, gave some interviews to a conservative author mm -hmm. in which uh, he talked about his conversation with then Senator Obama and made some other allegations. I was wondering what you thought about, first of all, the idea that this would be re-emerging now, and second of all, if the administration had any response to the things Reverend Wright has been saying in these interviews. Well, let me, uh, on the first issue, the I certainly did see the article, and I would point you to, uh, I think, the st a statement that the campaign put out about uh, this issue. I mean, it, it, I, I'll, I'll echo that and, and, and say that um, to, to launch a a multi-million dollar uh, divisive attack campaign uh, is not what the American people want. And I think these, there are moments when you have to stand up uh, and say uh, that that's not uh, the right way to go. And, and I, would, you know, I would point to a numerous comments that echo that, not just from Democrats and political observers, but by Republicans today. Uh, secondly, I, you know, I, the, uh, the book that is the foundation for the um, the other element of your question is, you know, not one that I would read because I know that the author uh, lacks. Uh, but it is the, it is the, it is what has given rise to this. Uh, lacks a certain amount of credibility, and I and I haven't uh, listened to the uh, interviews that you talk about. I I'm not a regular viewer of Sean Hannity uh, or reader of Ed Klein, but um, I think uh, what I can say is simply that you know we've. Some of these issues were, were uh, featured, as you mentioned, in the 2008 campaign, uh, much discussed. The President gave, as a candidate, uh, a very memorable, detailed speech about his views uh, at, in Philadelphia at the Constitution Center. And I, you know, I think uh, that was a memorable moment. And, and right now, in 2012, we're focused on uh, what the American people are focused on, jobs, the economy. Uh, issues of national security that Tom Donnell just just spoke about. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jay. Thank you. Uh, okay, I did promise Andre, and then April. Yeah.
Popova from the Russian question. Uh, the Russian press reports that there will be a meeting uh, between the president and the Russian prime minister. It will be slightly abridged. So my question is, will there be a meeting? Is it true that you are saving some subjects, including missile defense, for the later pre uh, meeting with uh, Putin? Well, I, as I think Ben Rhodes said as he was on his way out, uh, we don't have any announcements to make about other bilateral meetings uh, that may or may not pay, take place uh, at this time, but we may have more information for you uh, between now and, and uh, the, the beginning of the G8 uh, and the NATO summit. Uh, I, I, uh, and I don't have a schedule for the agenda uh, in Mexico. We're, we're, we're focused on the upcoming meetings. Uh, April? Jay, I want to piggyback off of what Jake had asked you. Since this president came into the Oval Office, he has worked hard to deal with issues of policy as well as his administration versus looking at issues of race. The issue of race is rearing its head again <laughs> with some of the words, metrosexual, black, ape, legal. How does this White House thwart those type of attacks as you have tried not to bring race into the issue? I, I think I would just repeat what I said to to Jake. The, the campaign put out a statement with regards to that specific story and that um, would-be campaign. campaign. But this I, is look, presidential portion. You guys look, have tried to walk think, away from that dealing with policy. Now it's coming back. I think some of these issues were very uh, uh, clearly uh, discussed and addressed back in 2008, and the President gave a uh, what be, I think became a uh, a highly regarded speech in Philadelphia during that campaign that, that, that talked about some of these issues. His focus is not uh, on that issue or those issues. His focus is on the work he needs to do to help this economy grow. And, you know, I'm not just saying that because uh, that's the preferred answer. I'm saying it because I know it for a fact. Uh, I know that that's the issue, that the economy and jobs are the issue that he spends uh, the vast majority of his time on, and that's what he's going to be talking about going forward. Our views on this ad campaign, I, uh, you know, are reflected in the statement by the campaign, which I uh, echoed. You know, it, you know, these kinds of divisive, uh, unfortunate uh, approaches are, are not, you know, are not what I think the American people want to see, and. Uh, I think in a, in a, in a, in a manner that's, uh, at least uh, in, in this early stage, uh, in the aftermath of that article, uh, somewhat reassuring. I think you've seen a, a broad array of people uh, criticize or condemn that approach. Uh, I, I don't really have anything to add on to that because that's not what we're spending our time worrying about here at the White House. You guys, we gotta, we've been doing this for more than an hour. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. Thanks a lot. Take care.